you would have us know. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, quick, uh, quick quiz review. Uh, identify the three offices of Christ. He is? Prophet, priest, priest, king. king. All right, theologians speak of the blank nature of Christ. Dual, dual. dual nature of Christ. Uh, we may summarize the nature of the joining of the two natures of Christ as blank without blank. Union without confusion. Yes, union without confusion. Why is this a helpful summary? Uh, well, just about every heresy confuses one or other end of that equation. It, they either don't understand the unity of the two natures, um, or they don't, uh, or they confuse the two natures. So, one of the one of the other is being compromised by the the heresies throughout uh, the history of the church. So they don't have a proper union, or they confuse. Uh, why was it necessary for the Savior to be both God and man? Okay, so the divine nature is able, uh, gives infinite worth to his death and sustains the human nature under the weight of the wrath of God. And human? To identify with us in our own nature, to be the second Adam, who undoes uh, what, uh, or does rather, well, undoes what Adam did and do does what Adam failed to do. Uh, the concept of the nature of the atonement is indicated by statement, the statements in 8.5 that Christ hath fully satisfied and purchased salvation for all those whom the Father hath given unto him. Uh, is this what is called blank atonement? Yes, that's what you fill in the blank. Huh? I mean, if that's a yes no question, it depends on what you fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. But limited atonement. Yes. Limited or definite. <laughs> or particular. Or if you want to cross out atonement and put particular redemption. Okay, number six. What is the relationship between the extent of the atonement and the efficacy of the atonement? Limited extent, Sufficient complete efficacy. efficacy. Excuse me? Limited extent, complete efficacy. Limited extent. So if you have a universal atonement where Jesus dies in exactly the same way for everyone, including those who are lost, it means you limit the efficacy. It means it doesn't itself save. A redemption is not actually purchased at the cross. So uh, it, uh, in order to uh, honor the efficacy, you have to limit the extent. He actually does save. He actually does bear our sin. He who knew us and became sin and bore our sin and made, um, and made uh, certain that we would be saved, having purchased our salvation, having died for the sheep that, that the Father had given to him. Okay, catechism, no? Two states of Christ are his humiliation and his exaltation. 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 List the main stages beginning with the, the resurrection, the ascension, the session, the return, and judgment. Okay. Uh, who is the redeemer of God's elect? This should just roll off the tongue. The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. And what offices does Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ, Christ as our Redeemer executes the offices of a prophet, priest, priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. Um, all right. And what does Christ, uh, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ, Christ executes, executes the office of a priest and in one is offering up of himself a as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and to reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. Okay, very good. So we, we launch now into studies 8 through 10. So you've got three weeks to get through this section if you didn't realize that and instead you just plowed ahead then then you are way ahead of the game
congratulations. Uh, all right, so we have injected into the system here a couple of chapters that date back to the 1903 revisions of the Westminster Confession that were adopted uh, by the Northern Presbyterian Church and then a few years later adopted by the Southern Presbyterian Church. Uh, if you read your notes, which I trust that you diligently do each week, you will see that I cast aspersions on these revisions as largely, largely being redundant. All right, so background, I, again, I trust that you read all of this diligently, but background, we have this statement made by B.B. Warfield, you know, professor of theology at Princeton Seminary, died in 1921, who said, in the same sense in which we may say that the doctrine of sin and grace dates from Augustine, the doctrine of satisfaction. By the way, remember as we go through now, satisfactio in Latin, satisfaction, is, is the language that's used in the confession because, that's the, because the confession reflects the language of Latin, which is the language of the theologians. So atonement is an English word, at one mint. And, and so that is not in the confession. The equivalent word is satisfaction. Christ made satisfaction. But anyway. Is that the same as propitiation? No, well, no, that's nuanced. Uh, no, propitiation has to do in particular with this putting aside of wrath. Okay, so satisfaction, uh, where am I? Um, satisfaction from Anselm, who gave that de kind of definitive articulation in the 12th century. The doctrine of justification by faith from Luther, we may say that the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is a gift from Calvin to the church. Now this, as we would have said in the 1970s, this blows the mind of the Pentecostals. Okay, the, like the Holy Spirit, like that is their, that's their territory. And when we come up with the idea that Calvin is the theologian of the Holy Spirit, they just, they just can't get over it. It just, just shatters their whole self-image. But in terms of the development of Christian theology, Warfield is making a claim that it, it can be substantiated. Calvin is the theologian of the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, here's what he says. It was, it was he who first related the whole experience of salvation specifically to the working of the Holy Spirit, worked it out into its details and contemplated its several steps and stages in orderly progress. Uh, that would be in our Ordo Salutis as the product of the Holy Spirit's specific work in applying salvation to the soul. What Calvin did was specifically to replace the doctrine of the church as the sole source of assured knowledge of God and sole institute of salvation by the Holy Spirit. In his hands for the first time in the history of the church, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit comes to its rights. So as an example, Shorter Catechism number 29, how are we made partakers of, of the redemption purchased by Christ? We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by his Holy Spirit. So what Christ accomplishes on the cross uh, is then applied to us. Back to John Murray's uh, book that I recommended to you, Redemption Accomplished, that's what Christ did. Applied, that's what the Holy Spirit does. So if we think about the redemption being uh, accomplished in Palestine 2,000 years ago, thousands of miles away from here, how, does the, how, how do we get the benefit of that debt? Uh, long ago and far away, how do we get the benefit of that, that death across all that space, thousands of miles, and all that time, 2,000 years? How do we get that benefit? The answer is the Holy Spirit working through the word brings that to bear upon us in the present moment. By the means of grace. Right? But working, the Holy Spirit working through the word brings those benefits to bear. Uh, so, so we are made partakers of, of the redemption purchased by Christ. How? By the effectual application of it to us by his Holy Spirit. Uh, for question 30 of the catechism, how does the Holy Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? The Spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us, thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. And then further along in the catechism, there's another question that, uh, that will identify the Holy Spirit as working through the primary uh, means of grace. So here's, here's a couple of more sort of parallel statements. 
how, how is the word made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. How do the sacraments become effectual means of salvation? The sacraments become effectual means of salvation, not from any virtue in them or in him that doth administer them, but only by the blessing of Christ and, what? The working of his spirit in them that by faith receive him. Uh, so this is the uh, consistent position that you find in the Westminster Confession as and it is, uh, it is uh, typical of Reformed theology. The Reformed understanding of how salvation happens. Happens by the Holy Spirit taking what Christ has accomplished and applying that to us, bringing to bear through the word, sacraments, and prayer, the primary means of grace, bringing to us the benefits of Christ's redemption. So the confession and catechisms specifically attribute to the Holy Spirit to the following. Do you understand what I'm doing? I'm calling into question why we need a chapter on the Holy Spirit according to 1903 revisions of the Confession, which, by the way, the PCA has never accepted. That's why I wondered why we were studying. When so that you will know <laughs> when one of those heretics from the main line, no, so that you'll, you know, you'll know why, why did the PCA not adopt it. Well, because it was a redundant, a largely redundant. So... Um, Here's what the, the confession and catechisms attribute to the Holy Spirit. It is, it is the source of religious authority, right? The Holy Spirit speaking through Scripture in Westminster Confession 1.5. Uh, effectual call, regeneration is a work of the Spirit. Justifying faith, adoption, sanctification, repentance, obedience, good works, perseverance, assurance, joy, the resurrection of the body. Um... That's pretty much the whole ordo salutis. Every step of salvation is being attributed to the Holy Spirit. Uh, so clearly it's the Holy Spirit who empowers the ministry of the church. The Spirit is the source of the efficacy of the ministry, the efficacy of the sacraments, enabling prayer, and effectual reading and preaching of the word. So this is why I, I, would, uh, uh, I, think, I think we should agree with Warfield that, that Calvin is properly identified as the theologian of the Holy Spirit because of the way in which he gives the clear articulation of the central role that the Holy Spirit plays in the application of redemption and in making effectual the means of grace by which we are saved. He is the first one to bring all that evidence together into one place. That's uh, that's. That's, that's his particular genius, yes. In paragraph three, isn't that, uh, isn't that an error there where he says that the Father is willing, ever willing to give it to all who ask him? We can't ask the Father for the Holy Spirit to come on if we're dead. Or we're well, but that's no excuse for not asking. <laughs> that's no excuse for not asking. I mean, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. The bones have to respond. But I mean, would that be, would that be error? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Jesus says, uh, you know, ask uh, the Holy, and Father will give the Holy Spirit. So I think that's a proper statement. Oh, and that the, um, whatever you ask um, in my name, can, it's so easy to misconstrue that to anything you ask. But in the context of that is uh, uh, a sermon on the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking about the Spirit. So when he says, whenever, whatever you ask, yeah. you know, say, so, ask for the Spirit. There's a difference between Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel. Because Jesus, you know, he preached these sermons over and over again and in different places and different times. And in Luke's gospel, it's, you know, it's asking, he will give you the Holy Spirit. It's specifically in Luke. And, 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 and actually, it, it, Luke Acts has a, has, uh, carries that theme of the Holy Spirit in ways that Matthew and Mark and John do not. He gives a particular emphasis in, in Luke and Acts. Okay, so this uh, section on the Holy Spirit. Is the chapter on the Holy Spirit added by American Presbyterians in the early years of the 20th century necessary? If you said anything but, wha uh, but why uh, no and gave reasons why not. Then Stand up and say so now. <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to just ask you to leave. Okay. Um, I don't think it was necessary. 
um, and I don't think it added anything. Question number two is the Holy Spirit and it or a he, a he or a he. Well, so it's, it's a, so a lot of popular language, you know, we end up uh, reducing the Holy Spirit to a power and use it. It's, it the Holy Spirit's not an it, the Holy Spirit's an e. It's the, the, you know, the third person of the Trinity. Uh, yes? Uh, that's kind of about the last section, but so they adopted this Holy Spirit chapter in 1903. Yes. But then, like, there wasn't a PCA in existence. Right, but there so was like, a... They didn't, they, they chose not to, they, like, picked an older version because they would have been already implemented for all the churches that were already coming out. Right, so the, the Southern Presbyterian Church, out of which the PCA um, came, when it, when, it, when it formed itself into a new denomination, went back to the 1787 Adopting Act, and the confession in the form it was at that time, including the American revisions on the um, statement on the civil government. So the, the, the Westminster Confession has a statement that unites church and state in a way that uh, the American Presbyterians could not. So that, that gets revised, but they rejected the revisions that took place at the beginning of the 20th century. In other words, they, they didn't include those in the adoption of the confession. The PCA, so 1973. Yes? So the PCUSA, or whoever actually wanted to adopt these things, did they actually publish a confession of faith with these Things in it? Yes. Okay, so there is one out there. So yes. You it's chapter 35. Right, 35. So they published it. They, they published it, they adopted it, and then they adopted, along with the Westminster Confession, several other confessions. And what that ended up doing was kind of diffusing the authority of the confession so that they're all just kind of museum pieces and have very little. Yeah, what's interesting in terms of denominational history is the. Uh, the mainline Presbyterian church has gone from where the confession was the crucial thing and they didn't even have a book of church order until fairly late in the game to where now you can confess anything you want to confess, but you better conform to that book of church order. You, got, you better do what the bureaucracy says or you're out. So the book of church order is everything. The confession is nothing. Whereas for us, the confession is everything. Book of church order, well, you know. Is that the same book of church order? Oh, no, this stuff's much later. Yeah. Much, much later. John Leith used to make much of this point. Uh, he was uh, one of those Southern Presbyterians who started out as a fairly liberal pastor, theologian, and over time got more and more and more and more conservative. Uh, till the end, uh, he was just going around the country denouncing the PCUSA and championing the PCA. And, uh, and he, made, he made that point that, you know, we, we got along for about 150 years with, without a book of church order. How, how can we elevate it to that status that we, that we have given it in recent times? Okay, question number three. What part has the Holy Spirit played in your salvation? To what degree does one need the Holy Spirit in order to become a Christian, to lead a Christian life? You should be saying that you need the Holy Spirit in order to become a Christian, and you need the Holy Spirit in order to live a Christian life. You are utterly incapable of either one of those things without the work of the Spirit. Unless you are born again, Jesus says, you will not see the kingdom of God. You won't see it. You won't enter it. It will be, remain incomprehensible to you. Yes, William? How do those two roles differ from the roles that Christ plays in your salvation? Um, like I say, the Holy Spirit is applying the benefits of Christ. So what role does he play? Those are the benefits that the Holy Spirit is bringing to bear upon the one being uh, saved. So it's Christ's saving work that is being applied by the Holy Spirit to the believer. And the Holy Spirit is, is a softening, regenerating, changing the heart so that it will be receptive to the message of the gospel, which will then be received by repentance and faith. So the Holy Spirit is enabling faith, enabling repentance, enabling sanctification, uh, enabling perseverance from A to Z, from start to finish, the Alpha and the Omega, the Holy Spirit enables everything that we can speak of about becoming a Christian and sustaining the Christian life. So, all right, uh, number four, uh, 30, 
uh, for two refers to what is usually called common grace. Give a biblical de- theological defense of the statement, he is the source of all good thoughts, pure desires, and holy counsels in men. The background to this, there, 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 there is there, 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 there is a statement in the confession. I probably won't be able to pull it out of my memory bank, but there is a statement in the confession that hints at, at the idea of common grace. It's not really clearly spelt out. Um, so Warfield says this is the one contribution. Now, the, the background to this is amongst the Dutch theologians, Herman Davink and uh, particularly Abraham Kuyper, who is an extraordinary individual. Uh, Abraham Kuyper was the uh, was the uh, was a, was a very liberal Dutch theologian who uh, went through the liberal the liberal seminaries and then went into the parish ministry and it was in the course of visiting the little old ladies in uh, the parish and uh, their witness to him he was con- converted and so he goes on then to found the Free University of Amsterdam. He was the publisher of a major newspaper and, and eventually became prime minister of Holland. And so he and Baving de- really developed this, this idea of common grace. Um, it's a concept that was out there. It predates them. It's not a novelty. It's just that they sort of gave it a, a label and an identity, which is given the doctrine of, t- of depravity. Oh. Yes. Uh, the strength of those statements that we have, we saw earlier in the confession. Given, the, given the, the, the total corruption of the human race, uh, how do we explain human achievement, human accomplishments? Uh, how, do we, how do we explain good that's done by the unregenerate, since their nature is so fallen and corrupt? How do we, how do we understand the good that it takes place? So the explanation that, that that, the, that this, uh, this chapter is giving is that's what we call not special grace, but common grace. Special grace is the grace that you receive for salvation. Common grace is grace that is diffused throughout humanity so that, uh, so that people are enabled, not because they have uh, you know, an inkling of good within them, but because the spirit in his common operations restrains evil and pr- prompts and promotes the good among, among people everywhere. So you have some, you have some examples. Um, uh, in Genesis 9, 5, and 6, uh, the, in, the, in, um, the instituting of capital punishment after the flood is for the purpose, Genesis 9, 5, and 6, of restraining human, human uh, evil. Genesis 29 uh, says that God restrained Ambimelech from sinning. Uh, 1 Samuel 25, 26 uh, says that God restrained David from killing and, and plundering Nabal. Um, you know, Daniel 9, 17 and so forth. He raises up one king, uh, takes down another. Uh, Isaiah 44, he, 45, he raises up Cyrus to rescue Israel in exile. I mean, that's a, that's a good thing. That's a good thing that he did in rescuing Israel from its exile and returning it to uh, the promised land. He calls Cyrus my shepherd and my anointed. So there God is prompting the good that human beings do. uh, And so that we can say at the same time, we we can recognize that people do good deeds. I mean, the Boy Scout helps the little old lady across the road. That's a good deed. We can recognize that. Uh, But that doesn't compromise the fact of human depravity. And wherever good is, it, it, it is, it is present because... Now, ultimately, God has prompted that. He's restrained the evil. He's prompted the good by the common operation of the Spirit. Yes? Are they glorifying God in that? Or is that, in that good? Or they I guess in a sense, you could say he, they're honoring God. They, they, um, not in a meritorious way, but... That is not their intent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they, like in their mind, it would be like glorifying humanity or that humanity is still good. No, I think Cyrus had his own agenda. I think Cyrus was a poly- polygamist. A polygamist, a polytheist. He was probably a polygamist probably too. Both. Undoubtedly, he was both, <laughs> and a lot of other things too. Uh, but he, you know, he he was a polytheist, and uh, you know, he didn't want to offend the gods of the Israel of the the Jews. So he, you know, he sent them back to build their temple, so that maybe that god, as well as a hundred other gods, would bless him. Uh, Matthew, did you have a question? 
No. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Warren. Uh, to what extent you make the distinction between the work of the Holy Spirit and the unconverted versus the residual image and likeness of God in the unregenerate individual, not the work of the Holy Spirit, but the residual image and likeness being involved? Well, I think, I think that's a good question. I think hell is hell because there's a complete withdrawal of all the influence of God and good. And so people will just degenerate into demons. When, when I read this, I was thinking, well, gee, this might have been an opening, a, a, a door put in by the more moderate folks to eventually say, the unregenerate really aren't so bad, <coughs> less than fully depraved, so to speak. And was it used that way, do you know? I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think so. I think I think it's it's rather a way of uh, explaining what we observe. You know. I, I, I don't think Werner I don't think Werner von Braun was a, was a Christian, but he built the Saturn V uh, you know moon rocket. Extraordinary human accomplishment. Um, that he had any interest in doing that. That he had skill to do that. All that. You know. Ultimately, you want to say all good is from God. And, and so it's through these these common operations of the spirit that he. You know, he prompts people to design governments and police forces and so forth that restrain evil, uh, to an implement programs and policies that are the, for the good of humanity. And they've, they've all got, you know, a mixture of motives for why they do it, but he's restraining evil, he's prompting the good. Well, the Holy Spirit certainly acts in creation. I, I think the remnant, yeah, I think the remnant of the image is that upon which the common operations of the spirit can work. There's something to work with there. Not that there's a remnant of good, but there's something there in that image and ability to reason, um, a, 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 to have emotional expression and, and, and the, 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 you know, the, the, the powers of the will and so forth that we'll look at in a minute. It requires the Holy Spirit for that to be expressed or can the unregenerate man not exhibit that residual I'm going to hold out for it takes God prompting. So ultimately it's the work of the Holy Spirit prompting, inspiring, moving, restraining that explains all the good that we see in the world. All good ultimately goes back to God. Uh, okay. Um, all right. That's one through four. Five. Chapter 35 is concerned with what has been called the free offer of the gospel since the confession has already taught that some men and angels are foreordained to everlasting death. How can this free offer be sincerely made? This kind of goes back to the question about gives the spirit to all who ask of them. Any who come to Jesus in faith and repentance will find him a perfect savior. That's the free offer of the gospel but only those who have been born again will want to do that. Right. Any who ask God for the Holy Spirit will be given it, but only those who have come to him, whom he has chosen, will do that. And we've seen, we've seen in the chapters on the decrees of God and on providence that the Bible does not try to reconcile the absolute sovereignty of God with the utter accountability of the human race. So there's no, there's no attempt. These things lie side by side. And I want to I give a couple of, of uh, examples of this. So this is Jesus in Matthew 11. Jesus declared, I thank you. He prayed, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things, what things, gospel things, uh, the, the, the things Jesus was teaching from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And everyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Um, hidden up here. And the restrictions, the limitations on what's revealed down here. Then, the next thing Jesus says. Come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you. Well, you just said that... Uh, they don't have the capacity to come to you because if, th if their things are hidden and only the, s the few the, the, or, the, or the, the particular ones that, that the son uh, uh, chooses to reveal the father 
can know the Father, then what's this? Well, there's no t attempt to explain it. They're just side by side. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm gentle and, and lowly of heart. For you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, for my burden is mine. So, so these things are just held in tension. They're not explained. It's, the, it's the, the problem of the infinite and the finite, the finite mind trying to understand the infinite. Both things can be true. Again, these are parallel tracks going off into eternity. They don't intersect in our minds. We'll never see the intersection of these two things. They're both true. Where, and, and where you get into trouble is where you try to reconcile one at the expense of the other. You try to explain away sovereignty in the name of human responsibility, you end up with a diminished God. You try to explain um, res uh, responsibility or, or, or allow a a sovereignty to overshadow responsibility, you end up with fatalism. So you have to keep these things in tension because that's what the Bible does. So again, we're willing to say everything the Bible says. We're, we're cautious about and, and careful not to go beyond what it says. We understand the tension. We're willing to say all that it says. We don't want to go beyond what it says. So again, Romans um, 8 to 29 and thir to 30, uh, for those whom he foreknew, we saw this last time, uh, to foreknow is to set love upon. That word knowledge is a rich, rich word in biblical. Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore his son. So he foreknew, not in some kind of abstract looking into some future that doesn't exist. It's that he set his love upon them before time. He also then predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, uh, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. So that's what we're going to see again and again. This is the golden chain, these unbroken links um, between that, that take us from eternity, predestination, to a call, effectual calling, to justification, to glorification. Then, all of chapter 9, the, the entire chapter is about election. Jacob I love, Esau I hated. Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Thou the, the thing, you know, made, it's a complain to the potter, why have you made me? I mean, it's absolute election, sovereignty, explaining why Israel doesn't believe, why they've rejected the Messiah. It's not a weakness of the gospel. It's not some defect in the presentation. It's, it's election. It's God choosing. And then 1013, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. <laughs> Just side by side without, without reconciling them. So we don't try to reconcile them. That's our position. That's the Calvinistic reform position is we don't try to reconcile things that are unreconcilable. We, we accept that there, there are things that we will never understand. It's our responsibility to affirm what the Bible affirms. Thomas? Um, so like, culturally, the sinner's prayer is a really big deal. And I feel like, like ex-evangelicals or different people, they'll, they'll be like, I, I really sincerely asked that Jesus come into my heart and Jesus changed my life. And he just, I didn't get an answer. And like as a Christian, like what can you, like, well you didn't do it right. You weren't sincere. God knew that you weren't sincere, so that's why it didn't work for you. Like how do you? I think there's something fundamentally flawed in somebody who says it didn't work for me. Um, do I believe the promise apart from? I think we're meant to believe the naked promise. The promise is made that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You sincerely repent of your sins and cry out to God for salvation in Jesus' name. You will be saved. Now you need to believe the promise. So why are you doubting the promise? Because you don't have a certain feeling? What, why, why are you not burying your head in the scripture and trying to find out everything you can about God? In other words, it seems to me that somebody struck a deal when they say that kind of thing. They, they've struck a deal with God and they're expecting, you know, I prayed this prayer, now I'm waiting for the benefits to start to flow in my direction including the emotions that I'm supposed to feel and the, the gifts that I'm supposed to enjoy and the benefits that come my way. So I don't think you strike a deal with God. I think you believe the promise and you just hang your hat there and you settle there and you don't deviate from it. Is, is that person uh, dealing with issues of, of assurance or are they saying Christianity just didn't work for me? Yeah, you see the difference in that. Or maybe they're expecting that God is going to work a miracle instead of working through your second cause as a means. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, th I just have to say, I think there's a deal being struck. Yeah, I mean, I've had fairly people very close to me say it didn't work for me. And I, you know, what do you mean it didn't work for you? There's a promise there. Did you believe the promise? Did you repent of your sins? Then it worked for you. What, 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 what's missing? What is it that you're expecting that isn't being fulfilled? Um, why are you not just persever persevering in faith? Why are you not trusting the word of God? Why are you not trusting the promises of God? What do you, what do you mean it didn't work? And on what basis are you expecting that? Yeah. Are, are your sins for you, your sins have been forgiven, haven't they? That's the promise. Uh, you've been reconciled to God. He's now your Father. Uh, you have the gift of eternal life. These are promises you're to believe and trust and trust Him. Not just trusting promises, you're trusting the God behind the promises. Matthew, did you? Have I just I'm thinking, sometimes the gospel is presented in such a way that the benefits that are presented or promised with the acceptance of Christ are not necessarily the benefits that the Bible promises. It's good life, it's peace, it's happiness. It's, it's, and it, it put it in a, in, a, in, a, in a horizontal level rather than on a vertical level. And so if those things don't come, it didn't work. Yeah, hey, let me tell you a story that I haven't told probably 20 years, so I don't think I've worn this one out. But when I, <laughs> when I came back from England, I was, I was part of a college group at this giant Lake Avenue Congregational Church. I came back, I was you know the seminary guy. And, and uh, so this, uh, this girl came up and started talking to me, and she said she was going to go to Israel. And I said, why? And she said, well, because, you know, like this whole thing, Christianity just didn't work for me. And I said, well, wh what, do you, what do you mean? She said, I'm just not experiencing the, you know, the peace and joy, I would put in parentheses, the euphoria that I was expecting. I've been struggling. It's been hard for me. It hasn't come easily to me. I, I'm missing something. I'm going to go to Israel, to the Holy Land. And maybe I'll find the missing ingredient that I haven't been able to discover up to this point. And so I verbally, savagely beat her with words. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I didn't. It, I think that that is a common, common, common mistake. Um, is 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 that of expectations, probably, but on the part of the evangelist or the booklet or whatever that you were led to believe. It was very helpful for me at a certain point in my Christian life when somebody said, uh, for many people, their problems just began when they became a Christian. Why? Because up to that point, they were just going with the flow, going with the tide of the culture. They were swimming in that and just coasting along, and there, was no, there were no problems. I mean, my first two years at USC in the fraternity, those were happy years. I was having a good old time. I wasn't doing anything terrible. I was still, you know, within the pale, but I wasn't at intention with much. And then when I became a serious Christian, there, uh, then I had a horrible year, my junior year. It was just terrible. I was very, very discouraged and down and depressed and in a very dark place for most of my junior year and came out of that my senior year. But, uh, you know, when somebody finally explained to me, yeah, you know what, uh, lots of us, our problems started when we became Christians. We're in conflict with our family. We're in conflict with our friends. We got ejected from our social circle. We were ostracized here and there, alienated, it, it, all sorts of things happened. I, that's the way I was. I was like the odd bod in the fraternity for a while there. Which are all promises. Yeah, yeah, those are the things that are promised, right. Yeah. Yeah, and this remember, we remember also the testimony of Martin Luther all the way back to his time on the futility and the vanity of pilgrimage and what do you call monkery and the experiential element, uh, you know, that the, the you're supposed to get when you do these things, and he learned way back then that that was all futile, and and it's it's so there's nothing new under the sun as far as this is concerned. Yeah. So I we we can expect the peace that passes understanding, Philippians four six and seven, the joy that's inexpressible and full of glory, First Peter one, that is a reality for us. I but I don't think it means it's instantaneous. Like you just flip the switch and now you have it. I think that it takes, a, it's a fight to get there. It's a, it's a fight, it's a process, it's, it's slow, it's arduous, it's, you know, there are high points and low points. And I think that the, 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 the underlying reality, you know, we're getting, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, so to speak. I think the underlying reality is, you know, if you're mapping the Christian life and here's the years and here's the point at which you become Christian, it's kind of like this. You know, you're, 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 you know, three steps forward, two back, three, you know, four forward, two more back. And, but over time, over many years, 
You do. You grow in contentedness and in peace and in joy and in holiness. Excuse me? What's, what was your y-axis? Holiness. Sanctification. Sanctification. Joy, peace, contentedness, and so forth. Where was that? Yes. Uh, another question. Again, this might take us a little bit again too far away, but when you talk about uh, just um, trusting in God, like what does that look like in the more day-to-day uh, context? Trusting in God. Um, so, I think it means, for me, it means I get up early in the morning and I read the Bible and pray. Um, so that I'm filling, filling myself with his word and that's ar- providing some armor for me for life in the day and I'm praying um, and, and praying that I'll have strength. I'm confessing my sin. I'm, con- I'm praying about uh, the day's events and, and big, big issues and all that because I believe that God will hear those prayers and that he'll grant the requests. And so I'm, I'm, be- I'm in other words, I'm believing. So I'm believing these things and so I'm, I'm doing these things because I believe these things. And I'm seeking his fellowship, so I'm, that's, uh, that's at the center of what I'm doing in the morning, and then I'm trying to live obediently, and, and serve. I'm not just trying to, I'm trying to avoid living for myself, and selfishly, and in a self-centered way, and practicing sacrificial love. Um, what was your question? <laughs> what is trust? Trust. Well, trusting that, the, you know, the Bible's true. God's word is true. Jesus is Lord. He's the Savior. So I'm do- living everything in life in light of that reality. I'm trusting that all that is true, and that then determines everything. And he's working mm-hmm. everything else out for the good of our salvation. Good. That's what we go through on the day to day. Yes, and and uh, when I get knocked down by something, I know it's by the hand of God, and I'm trusting it. By the way, I'll get you in a second here, William. By the way, great story from Evan Gear. You know, uh, Jamie and the kids w- went on a you know a field trip or something, and on the way back, the car broke down and. You know, Jamie was brought up a Pentecostal. And she's a full Presbyterian and all that. And uh, the oldest daughter is, uh, uh, Jane, Liza Jane is in the catechism class. And we, we just had gone over providence. And everything is by the hand of God. And you can know that and have confidence in that and trust. And I told them a story about breaking my leg and, you know, all by the hand of God and the purposes of God and, and knowing all that. And so Jamie said, why, why, did, why did this happen? And little Jane Eliza said, well, Mom, you know, it's all by the hand of God. <laughs> <laughs> my little, my little, my little Presbyterian daughter instructing my Pentecostal wife. <laughs> William? Um, trusting God in the day-to-day, it takes different levels over the course of the day. Like, if you've done something a thousand times, you know, you just kind of do it. You know, you put your mind into that gear and you do it. But then things happen, like you talk to a customer who's unhappy, and you're already stressed out, and you don't want to snap on them. So you're trusting in God in that moment to, Lord, don't let me, please, don't let me bite this person's head off. Or, you know, your boss calls you aside. Things that don't happen very often, that are out of the norm, that are outside your comfort zone. Like, God, I'm outside my comfort zone right now. I'm a little bit on edge, or really on edge. But I trust that this has purpose. This has meaning. Help me catch it. Yes, these are divine appointments. Whoever you encounter during your day, it's a divine appointment. Uh, and you treat it as such. We're promised joy, we promised contentedness, we're promised peace, but that does not define itself as a lack of trials or the absence of trials. It's all of that despite. Yeah. Or, so, or trust, trials. Trust, trust is, trials. Uh, we can have joy in those trials. We can have contentedness in those trials. Is it trust almost defined by the idea of difficulty and trials and <laughs> hardships? Um, you know, when did I'm just I think about day camp and the climbing and the challenge course. And when does a kid have to trust? When they re- when they really have fear? When mm-hmm. they really are fearing falling or failing? That's when trust comes comes into play. Otherwise, trust is meaningless, isn't it? Yeah. So here's here's a little premarital counseling that I've used in the past that I think is helpful, at least it is to me. 
I think that we're meant to have a bedrock of joy, peace, and contentedness. I've learned to be content in all the circumstances, the Apostle Paul said. He's going to get his head chopped off before too long. Um, but he's learned to be content. Uh, well, what if you're a single man and you want to be married, you're eager to be married, and you um, are experiencing some anxiety about that, and you're upset about that, and you're discontent? Well, I think there is a divine discontent. I think we're I think that's built into us. Uh, you know, Eve was brought to Adam. We were, there's a sense in which we're meant to be married. If it wasn't for the fall, we would all be married. There wouldn't be any, you know, I don't think there'd be any singleness if there hadn't been a fall because we're meant to be married. It's not good to be alone. Uh, so, however, I would say to young couples when they're getting about to get married that, uh, that even with this suitable, appropriate, understandable, divine discontent about being single, that should rest on a bedrock and unmovable peace, contentedness, and joy that never uh, it can be taken from you. And if you're not getting married on the basis of that, you're probably getting married for the wrong reason. If you're getting married thinking that that person I'm going to marry is going to be the source of my and my happiness is all wrapped up. If I get her, boy, that's going to be life. That's yeah. life. I'm going to really be you know, on my way then. You're putting a weight on her shoulders and on that marriage that it's not meant to sustain. They are not Jesus. They are not the Savior of the world. They are not the bread of life. They're not going to, a spouse is not going to feed your soul and, and give you satisfaction and fulfillment. Only Jesus can do that. And if if that uh, is not there, you're getting married in the, for the wrong reasons probably and you're going to have problems. You're not marrying the Messiah. And I, I think all of these things that we've been discussing, this lack of immediate, you know, I prayed the prayer, nothing happened, and, and the follow-ups to that for the peace and joy, it's, it's pretty consistent that you get out of it what you put into it too. I mean, there's a basis for it all the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. But you pray a prayer and that's all you do. I mean, I learned a lot about uh, my own personal walk just from the first seven weeks so far. Because I, I asked you at the beginning, it says, be as a little child, have faith as a little child. Well, I can do that. I have that. I believe it because it's in the Bible. But the depth of it and the understanding of it and the peace increases and grows when you put more work into understanding it. Right. You know? So I think part of the outlook we should have is, to begin with this, God doesn't owe us anything. Right. He makes this promise. You claim the promise. You repent of your sins. You put your trust in Christ. He doesn't owe me anything. And uh, he's, he, my life's not my own, right? I, I am not, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, right? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. It's not, our, it's not your life anymore. I've been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, I no longer live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, I, you know, I, I, I surrender claims to, to anything and everything. One of my favorite things during Psalms class is God interprets our circumstances. We don't use our circumstances. Yeah, we might have talked about that in the chapter on God. I don't, I don't recall if we did or not, but... You know, you're, you, the only way for a Christian to understand circumstances is starting with God and what's true of him and working down to the circumstances. And what typically people do is they start with the circumstances and they work up. And so things are going wrong and they figure God doesn't care, God doesn't know, can't, God can't do anything about it, God doesn't want to do anything about it, God is, the, I'm mad at God, I'm disappointed with God. I mean, you hear all this. Does God still, does he, does he remain good? and wise and all-powerful uh, in all circumstances. Yes, well then you start reinterpreting the circumstances in light of the facts that are true about God. You don't interpret God in light of the circumstances that are around us. And if you must be born again, you're not born with all this knowledge and all this understanding and all this appreciation. If you're born again, you're a baby and you're starting out, right? So you get it as you progress through your Christianity, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, uh, number six. Um, what does the confession teach concerning the destiny of those who have never heard of Jesus Christ? What about the so-called heathen in Africa? How does your position on this affect your perspective on world missions? Well, 
Here is what the, the confession says in chapter 10, section 4, but here's larger catechism number 60. Can they who have never heard the gospel and so know not Jesus Christ nor believe in him be saved by their living according to the light of nature? In other words, they have, the, they have the sort of a sense of right and wrong. They have some religious concepts. They practice their religion according to the light that they have. Is that going to be sufficient? They who, having never heard the gospel, know not Jesus Christ and believe him not, cannot be saved, be they never, we would say be they ever, so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature or the laws of that religion which they do profess. Neither is there salvation in any other but in Christ alone who is the savior only of his body the church Galatians 3:20 if righteousness were through the law and i think law here represents the whole spectrum of of law works religion then christ died for no purpose in the nasv he died needlessly so what what impact do you imagine it happens if you come to the point as a denomination as a church that you believe that that people can be saved by their own native religions. You're not going to go out. <laughs> what? You're not going to go out. You're not going to go. And so the history of missions from the 1920s to the 2020s is shrinking missionary forces in all of the main. There are mainline churches. There are more missionaries being sent out by the PCA with 300,000 members than by the PCUSA with three million members. At least that's what they had until they lost another million. So, so why, why you know, in other words, if people can be saved by their law keeping and their religious rituals and ceremonies, why, why would we interrupt that? Why would we disturb that? A and I think you'd have to say, if it's only by rejecting Christ overtly that you, that, uh, that you uh, are condoomed to, doom uh, doomed to hell, then gospel preaching and missions becomes the single greatest agency in sending people to hell. Just leave them alone, and they'll get along okay, and you know, God will accept their good works or their rituals and their ceremonies and their religion. They'll, 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 that'll, that's a, that's a, you know, a way to heaven well enough. Just leave it be. As a matter of fact, you should wish that you'd never heard of Jesus because then you'd go to heaven and your life had been a lot easier on the way there too, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have been ostracized by the members of my fraternity. Yeah. Still going to uh, Matthew? Uh, the, 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 the truth of election is that evangelism is going out and finding the elect, is it not? I mean, let's go find them and, by presenting the gospel. Charles Spurgeon said once that if being elect meant that people had a yellow stripe down their back, I would be pulling shirt tails out all over London. <laughs> I want to find those people. Well, and as we were going through Acts, I forget which chapter it was, uh, um, is it 14 maybe, where the Apostle Paul is given that vision of Christ and he says, uh, you know, persist, I have many people here. Yet to be, in other words, many people yet to be discovered, yet to hear the gospel and respond to it, those who are among his sheep whom he is determined to save. Okay, so. Did, that you, mention, did you mention your quote, pray like a cow? Uh, no, no, but that's, uh, you know, I think that's another Spurgeon is, you know, he, he prays, prays like he's a uh, Calvinist and it's all up to God and he, he evangelizes like an Arminian and it's all up to him. I'd rather he preach like a Calvinist, but it's okay. Yeah. 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 Thomas? Uh, so, we're kind of in a position where the majority of the world is actually like Judeo-Christian religions like Islam. Judaism, Mormonism, like they're all kind of in the ballpark of the God of the Bible. And I feel like a lot of people are sort of like, well, you know, Jewish people, they believe in the God of the Bible in a sense. It's like not, it's, you know, good, better, best. And like, we're the best. But Judaism is okay. Like, Islam is kind of okay. And like, I kind of see the, like, yeah, sort of. But there is a monotheistic. God, but like, how do you emphasize that, like, you know, no, you need the right version. Mm -hmm. Like, the God of Islam is different. Oh, he's very different. But I think you go, you go back to Christ. 
Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John, you know, John 4, 14, 6. Um, uh, Acts uh, four twelve. There is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Uh, so they may have some things right. They may have monotheism right. They may have providence right. They may have creation right. But they've got redemption all wrong. And, and so, you know, Islam is works. Mormonism is works. Hinduism is works. They all, they all are a system of works where they assume that humanity is good enough that we, it's possible for us to earn, merit, deserve salvation, make ourselves right with God. So they, they're fundamentally wrong. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Allah is not the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, right. The Jews' God is not the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not the triune God. He, uh, they don't recognize that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't recognize that he's the second person of the Trinity. They don't, yeah. Y yes. Um, this might take us again for the field. In C.S. Lewis's uh, last battle, I don't know um, the right towards the end, there's a Dudley, I think it is, who is kind of saved, even though he worships a different god called Tash. And Aslan talks to him and he says um, that whatever you did in his name, you actually were doing in my name. Is that, um, is that what Presbyterians hold as well? Or is it since you, I guess, for that? I, I am a terrible student of fiction. I think but Lewis was was playing off of, of uh, Jesus saying, "I have sheep that are not of this fold." I think that's where Lewis was was coming from in that story. But I um, isn't what Jesus meant there it was. Uh, many of my sheep are not Jews; they're yes. Gentiles as well. Yes, right. oh, yes. We, Gentiles. We we also have. From Lewis's stepson, he he was reading this as basically his backside. <coughs> so Romans one says, "You know from creation that there is a God, and you're not worshiping Him. Therefore, you are without excuse." So Lewis is looking at that backwards and saying, "But you are worshiping what you know from nature." So therefore, it, it's troublesome. At least Lewis is a great apologist. He's not a theologian. He's not reliable as a theologian. He's a great apologist, wonderful uh, writer of fiction, um, but you can't, he, he didn't even pretend to be a theologian. You can't, you can't go to him to formulate your theology. And yes? I was, I was just going to say on, on that, um, doesn't um, God say that everything goes back to him anyway and all things glorify God? Even, even like something that somebody will say that's secular, something that they say will still speak Yeah, that, that, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the, 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 there's a Muslim city council up in Michigan that just banned the, uh, the uh, rainbow flag in their city. Right. And uh, the progressives are going nuts over it because they're one of the, you know, one of the protected minorities. Um, so they're just throwing them off the roof. But, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's, I, that's a good thing. I, I think that's a good thing. That's good for that's good for that city. That's good for our civilization. Does does that mean they're going to go to heaven? No. No. So we can recognize that. I you know I preached about co belligerence a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's a lot of people we'll link up with for common causes, but that doesn't affect our doctrine of salvation, our understanding of the path to heaven. I am the way, the one and only way. Those are definite articles. The way, the truth, the life. You miss the positive affirmation and the negative. No one comes to the Father but by me. So don't, we can't try to establish another pathway to heaven. Yes? What, what's the difference between a theologian and an apologist? Um, Depending on what you just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Go talk to Matthew. Let's take a five-minute break. <laughs>